Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Dave back from the band Angerbox with my sidekick. This is Jimmy from Angerbox. And today, guys, we are on location at Lash Balls Bar and Grill for episode two with our buddy John Guthier. Guthier. Give it up. Yeah! Thanks, guys. Good to be here. How what? you doing, man? Well, it's Monday, and, well, we're all not at work right now, so we're doing well, we're right? We're drinking beer. Exactly. We have some music. Cheers, Cheers buddy. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to that. You guys, make sure you hit that subscribe button at Angerbox Official on our YouTube page. Flash Balls Bar and Grill was kind enough to let us set up and do our thing here tonight. Thanks for being part of our studio. Flash yes. Balls, enjoying your food audience. And make sure you tip those ladies out there, guys, working hard for you. So, all, all two of us applaud. Two. Yeah. It's all right. It, it has to start somewhere. Yeah. Get, get a get a view of the, the, the crowd out there yeah, so I mean, they know it's not just me and John and Dave up here. <laughs> <laughs> they're all eating. That's the, They're enjoying their meal. That's because it's uh, $15 all you can eat. Wings, fries, and celery. Monday night, last balls. Like always. Yeah. I'm getting hungry already, guys. <laughs> KFC ain't got shit. All right. <laughs> all right. John, you sent me some music. I'm going to play some of it. Tell me about it. Well, um, let's see what we got here first. Oh, okay. Well, um, most of what I do in 28 Speedway is fairly traditional. We do dance band type stuff. And, you know, we tend to favor kind of a softer edge, but it's what we do pretty well. Although with Renner and, you know, adding in John Robinette, we've gotten a little heavier. In terms of my own stuff, it's a little, as we would say, avant-garde. I did not know what to expect. And I'll be honest, I went to the gym today, and I put this on the playlist, and I was letting it rip at the gym today, and I felt like I was in a jungle, and I was <laughs> running across the terrain. I had no idea what was coming next, but I was in the moment, in the music. It's kind of spacey. Well, I spend a lot of time in production. Like, like for me, that was kind of an interest, but this particular track happened... Um, I went through a period of about two years of really bad insomnia where I just didn't sleep for like days. And a lot of this stuff is just me being up in the middle of the night, working, plugging we, into the things. We've traded messages later yeah. night, being and, up. Yeah. So yeah, the, the chronic insomnia club, you mm -hmm. know, it gets us all. But um, I found that a lot of times it helped me get through it. So maybe music is therapy, I don't know. But a lot of times it's it really just is about me just messing around with production and you know just trying different sounds out what do you record on um well this particular recording was a combination of i started out on my ipad building some basic beats and then um i imported it all into reason on my computer i used a lot of um reasons a uh, digital audio workstation that's geared toward keyboard players okay and um, then I just did some manipulations at that point. Now this particular track. This is called Luna. Tell this me is, about this This one. is Luna. Luna, I did this seven years ago and I did this all on hardware, if you can actually believe it. And it's a mix of uh, a Korg Chaos pad, which does all the effects in real time. It's like an XY pad. You can do a lot of weird sweeps. Um, and a Chaosolator, which is just a tone generator. And the beginning of this recording, believe it or not, started out on an iPad on a children's music app. Like all the little blips and bloops right. that you hear in the background. It's a drawing thing. You'll, you'll draw a picture and then drop different sounds into it. And it'll just blip. And it's all pentatonic huh. stuff. And the kids love it because it always sounds good. So I started messing around. I was like, man, this sounds really cool. So I imported all that. And I did the drums at the end. Like I started out with the actual just the ambient stuff and then layered rhythms. And honestly, it, it was just, it was really odd. And when I was done, I promptly put it away and forgot about it. And then when you contacted me, like I had just rediscovered it like two weeks before you contacted oh, me. Yeah? And I was like, you know what? Let's throw this one down because uh, it's kind of a mix of everything I do. It's really weird guitar. This might sound funny. It's just kind of cool. You think that you of all people sent this to me. But when I hear this one, this is what I think about. I'm in school and I have a test and the teacher put this on to listen to, for us to listen to while we're taking a test. So I have to ask, have you done that? Because that's what I get when I, like I, I, I'm on a task given by somebody and there's a time limit and it's the song. That's what I hear. 
Well, I don't know if I've ever like tormented my kids with my own music, but I would. You know, I, I, I think that you're right. I mean, how often do we find ourselves doing a project or working on something, and what do you do? You throw music on in the background, and uh, this is something that it just makes those tasks a lot easier. I don't know. Like when I write, like for me, it, it is completely self-indulgent. It's not commercial at all, but. You could score a movie, but but well, it, it is. It's it's just it's ambience, yeah, and that's what I hear. And maybe one day that door will open. I don't know, but for now it's kind of just exploring. George Lucas here's should a, be calling you. You know, here's kind of a difference between you and me as musicians. You're that musician that you don't have to think about other musicians because you can literally do it all. Yeah, but I would also argue that having other musicians makes us better because oh, it does. If, if you're stuck in your own head working on your own stuff, a lot of times you lose that objectivity of. I can tell you right now, my solo album would suck. That's not that's not true either, because you got to try first. But the thing is, is when you listen to the same mix over and over and over again, sometimes you're like, okay, your ears get tired, and you miss out on obvious details. When you have a, a band in a room and everybody's playing together, you have objectivity and people that can sit there and go, no, that's great, but no, that's terrible. Don't do that. And, you know, I still think that although I like to write solo stuff just for my own entertainment, and that's exactly what it's for, when it comes down to it, being locked in with a band, nothing beats that. That's solid. No doubt. Yes. You're never going to that. You, you could do a lot Cheers of electronic stuff, but you're never going to replace live, real musicians. And that's just the way it is. You know, I was having a conversation with someone recently that was not judging this person in a negative light, but they're wrapped up in their dollars. And I was telling him, I don't care the amount of money. There's there's not a dollar sign that can buy the passion that playing with another group of musicians can bring in the moment. It, it doesn't matter uh, whether we're playing in a basement practicing. I mean, we love to gig and record and play shows, but as long as we're in unison playing together, that moment you catch with a couple other musicians, you can't describe that. You, nothing else is like it. It's magic. You know, it, it's kind of like the, the way I describe it sometimes is, you know, when you're everything's working right and the band is locked into the groove you have something that they call flow state athletes talk about this all the time it's like they get in the zone they can play at a level that is just it seems inhuman and on that note i'd like to also say you're you know i'm going to compare you to tom brady right now oh man the goat you're one of those people that no matter who is playing with you just because they're playing with you you're going to bring out the best in them, just that your style of playing. Uh, that's something you do as a musician, and you're not taking the lead by any means, but playing with you brings the best out in other musicians that are playing with you, and I've noticed that about you. Well, you know, the advantage for me of getting into that position was because, one, I'm a terrible singer, so I started finding, like, I've spent my entire life way over my head, you know? Like, I was a rock and roll guy, and then I went to college, and, you know, they made a great effort to give me a good education. They exposed me to a lot of great stuff, but I was also playing rock and roll on the weekends. Young Kerr dogs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know... Shout out to you, Aaron Kerr. Aaron Kerr. He's got to get Again. on this show. He definitely does. But, you know, like, I'll give you an example of how weird this is. I have enough history in this town that I've had the opportunity to play music with Aaron Kerr. I've also... You know, been to school with Derek Shank. We both graduated from Potomac State together. Shout out to Derek, and he's a great musician. Yeah. And then Derek, I was, you went on the show. You're on, man. You just say when. And then I was always, you know, at the time I was playing with Scott McIntyre. And let's face it, you know, as a kid, I was in way over my head, and I was playing with musicians that were way better than me, and they suffered me well. But I have video. Of you. Yeah, and, I, and you know what? When I watch those videos, it really is like a time capsule for me, like. I thought you did well. But at the same time, All of you. It, it was because those guys were working on me and they wouldn't accept anything but a yeah. certain level. They said, right. listen, you're an entertainer. Get out there and entertain. And that's how my attitude is with cover bands. You know, people are paying you money and it's all right to have a drink every now and then and have fun, but you're expected to bring right. a certain level of quality. Right. And my attitude has always been being around all these great singers and musicians that my job is to window dress what they do and if i can make a singer sound better even by just laying back and playing and just comping in the background i'm doing my job and let's face it when a, an audience comes out to listen to a band their main focus is usually the singer 
I mean, the singer can make or break your band, either by, you know, their ability or their charisma, because right. you have to have both. You have to get up there in front of an audience, and it's different when you're playing guitar or keyboard, because you can kind of sit in the back and play your parts, but the focus isn't so directly on you. When I see a good singer on stage with that charisma, you know, I'll give you a, a good example from earlier, Chelsea was talking about, Chris Nodrell. Chris Dodgell has personality. He's yeah. a hell of a front man. Personality sells. And and yeah. you know what? When he walks on stage, it doesn't matter what he does because you're going to be there because he has the enthusiasm. And I think that's what I look for in a singer. Yes, you have to be able to do your job, but you also have to look like you, you love it because most of them, the real good ones, mm. they love every minute of yes, it. they do. It's amazing. I was, uh, I was doing some deep internet digging today, and I found a song. Uh, this is at least 15 years old. This is from a, a local native band that was hugely followed, Quid Pro Quo. Oh, John Mallet. I told you I was yeah. going to play this song. Uh, this song's called Carve Your Name. And it's about 15 years old. This is uh, from Quid Pro Quo, Johnny Malik. Let's do a shot. I hear that. Thank you to, to Lashball for providing some wonderful shots for us tonight. And Cheers, it, guys. it is Monday, $15. All you can eat wings, fries, and celery. Do it. Cheers. Thanks for watching the social. Okay, so here's a story for you. Maybe now, weird. John Malik and I don't know each other really personally well, but we've met on several occasions. The first time I saw John Malik was in Frostburg with Aaron Kerr. Oh, they man. were playing in a band called, like, oh, yeah. I think, like Liquid Lemon Number no. 9. I mean, it was really bizarre. And that was the first yeah. night that I met Aaron Kerr. And Aaron Kerr's up on stage playing the guitar behind his head. <laughs> and I'm sitting back there as a teenager just giving him that look, you know, the mean mug, the musician mean mug. And I'm like, man, that guy, he's full of himself. I mean, he's good, but he's full of himself. And, of course, the running joke is, is Aaron actually is pretty laid back. And he's a performer. Aaron and I, of course, like a year later, became fast friends. We played with one another through Junkyard Dogs and The Answer with Scott McIntyre and Lady NVIDIA. And, you know, I consider him one of my best musical friends because we've just played music for so long. But yet, it was just because we went out that one night, me and a buddy, uh, Travis Brashears, we went out and he was like, you got to see my friend Aaron Kerr. And sure enough, I was like, man, that guy can play guitar. Another thing I can say about Aaron, too, um, he's very good at warming the crowd. For not being a front man, he's pretty good at taking control of a situation, warming the crowd up. Um, and being in Lady, Junkyard, let me start there. Let me, being in Junkyard Dogs to, uh, to Lady, NVIDIA, to Forgan Saul now, man, he's been, while he's growing, as a, as a guitar player, he's been the same style musician the whole way. Oh, yeah, and yeah he's, he is and he's himself. he's true to himself and true to what he was best at. It is best at, I should say. <laughs> um, well, and, and I've always respected that. Like, you knew what you were gonna get. You didn't. I've never seen Aaron Kerr have a rough night. It's I, you're getting what you paid for. Yep, and, and you know it, it's amazing because he he's always had this idea in his head of exactly what he wants to sound like. Now, don't get me wrong, he works for it. I, I've watched him tweak pedals and tweak stuff, but you know when you see him out on stage and he's playing. The amount of work that he actually puts into it behind the scenes. Hey, honestly, if you look at it, over the years I've taken breaks from from different bands and playing live playing just to take a break because of different things in life. I don't think Aaron Kerr's ever stopped. I, 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 I legitimately think that Aaron has been playing guitar regularly almost like every other weekend probably for 20 years. You know, I like to say there, there was a, a specific lineup I saw for I don't know how long this specific lineup was there, but of a lady in video where uh, you were you were, uh, you were there, Brent B Rim was there, um, Aaron was there, Angie was there. Um, Might have been Dave Green playing maybe, drums, maybe from Shadowburn. But that lineup for I, I think I came to like three shows back to back. Oh, it was it was good, and you know no discredit to any other rendition of the lineup in any uh, direction, but that specific lineup, you guys were on it. Um, and when I was talking to Chelsea, how was it following in? Talking to you, what was it like playing with playing with those group of musicians together? Because I think everybody in that band, anyone that's been in the band in that band, all had their unique special something to bring to the table. Well, 
I've always felt it, it was kind of a running joke in the band. Not to make your brother. You got to play with your brother yeah, in the band, yeah, too. Yeah. The running joke in the band for years was Lady and Video was like the local musician's union because everybody would eventually play. Like, I mean, literally, like John Robinette, our current drummer right now, even subbed a couple times. Like, he came out to a gig subbing for Lady and Video with like two weeks of practice, learned 40 songs, and played on a broken foot. He shows up in a cast, <laughs> and I'm like, are you going to be okay? And he's like, I got this, man. And sure enough, he hit everything. And when he was done, I was like, wow, that was amazing. But, you know, when it comes down to Lady and Video and whatnot and all the different lineup changes, I, the one thing I can say about what Angie and Aaron for a long time and, and Barry and, and TJ and all those guys, that unit that kept Lady and Video going was... A solid crew. They, they, it was a good crew. And your band lives and dies by its crew because they're the ones that are doing all the stuff in the background. Like, you have Patrick out here. I mean, yeah. These are the guys that are, that are truly invested in what you're doing and want to be part of it because, you know what? It's it's a lot of work. People don't realize the amount of hours that everybody else puts in just to make a show happen. It's not about just walking on stage and strumming your instrument. It's the rehearsals. It's the the bookings. It's the videography. You know, if you want to have a legit band in 2021, you have you can't just do one thing. So you know, I have nothing you have but time for to do a podcast. <laughs> well, well, but at the same time, you know, it just goes to show you that music is changing and you either change with it and continue to grow right. or you become less relevant yeah. and Good. hey what exactly you guys right. are doing right now is the next step you're your own promotion machine appreciate that man and appreciate you being on in, in this day and age you have to be your own promoter you know when we were growing up it was all about getting that record deal oh yeah and you know what that kind of kind of dissipated What's that? The, the internet was the great equalizer but it also exposed the fact that a lot of people were getting ripped off I mean when you think about it look at someone like Billy Joel Billy Joel, during his prime, was basically being ripped off by his management, and all yeah, those classic like songs. Really bad, I heard. All those classic songs that you that you hear on the radio all the time. He didn't like make any money at all, and it's it was just shame. because of a bad deal. Nowadays, if you can, you know, the whole do-it-yourself mentality. Well, what was Brenton saying? Lindsey Buckingham. What the fuck does he know? Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's just you really see a change in, in the way things are done, and I think it's a good thing. No, people won't be making billions of dollars off of album sales anymore. But you know what? You retain artistic control, right. and that has always been the biggest thing. Because you think about it, even okay, modern day stuff. If you want to talk about it? Look at Taylor Swift. Right. I know that sounds kind of a strange topic for us to talk about, but she doesn't really own the rights to her music. So she's re-recording everything so she can get around what actually happened to her, you know, in terms of the contract negotiation. So, you know, I, I think one of the most important things nowadays is protecting your artist's rights. It's, you know, the last thing I could say about that is, is, you know, back in the day, Jim Morrison, The Doors, you know, we think of him as this wild, crazy guy, and he was, no doubt, but he always insisted on the earliest albums that everything was split four ways, because he knew that, you know, the the record labels were going to try to rip them off, and let's face it, when you're in a band, it really, everybody, you know, is, is working together, right. so everybody deserves an even cut. Now, look songwriting royalties are a completely different thing mm -hmm. but in terms of how he handled it I always thought that was pretty brilliant you right. know cuts down on the arguments Nicky Six bought all of his rights to their music too but if you look plus he wrote it all maybe so it is. there's a lot of older bands now as they're getting to retirement right. age they're selling their rights to these big companies and yet yeah, they deserve that payday I, yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that sure. But I would severely caution any new artist coming out to sign with like any really big label without looking at the fine print because well, they're just, there to make money. Yeah, and if you're here, working for them. Yeah, then yeah. I really feel like if you're at that point, you've already got an independent following. You, you could probably do it on your own and yeah. do just as good, if not better. Today you can. The yeah. I, I'm saying, look, for it's all, just getting there. For first. all of the ills that we have with the internet and the problem that we have, you know, with the social media. It is still the great equalizer, and what you bring to the table, you control. Right. And you know what? I think that's a good thing, because in the long run, you think about record labels as a whole, 
were a great boon because it opened up music to the world. But the reality of it is, now that the internet's there, you don't really need a bunch of middle managers telling you how to produce your show and write your music. Right. And think of how many classic albums you grew up listening to that you love, only to hear the next album and know that somebody was meddling right. in the whole process. So, you know, hey, look, all the young people out there going and doing their own stuff and blazing their own way, go for it. Yeah. I tell the kids all the time in my classroom, I'm like, don't be afraid to be weird. Don't be afraid to follow the stuff that you like. Because you know what? You're the one creating the future for music. So respect the old ways, learn from the old ways, but carve your own path and, you know, take it in a different direction so that the next generation that comes around will be inspired just like we were. Because that, like, I, I was lucky. I got to play with people older than me. And when it came down to it, I don't think I'd be the musician I was. Even going to college, if it wasn't for being in the trenches, hauling equipment at 2 a.m. in the snow, yeah. and dealing with the reality of being a live musician. Because that's what it's all about. It's coming back to it. Live music, once things open back up again, I think you're going to find it's going to take more prominence than anything. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna shut down all the classic albums because we all have albums that we love and we grew up with, but music has always been about performing live. Before they could even record stuff, it was about playing live. And we're getting back to that. And you know what? I, that, that gives me hope for the future. Yeah, there's still gonna be brilliant albums, but live performance, you know, if you really want to prove that you're a real musician, you get on stage yep. and you show them that you can play your own music right. and you can play other people's music to a professional level. And we got a great town for that with a lot of great players. Western Maryland has, you know, I've got, I've been fortunate to travel. I've lived in Vegas. I've been all over the world. And I have to say about, about my hometown, about Western Maryland, there is so much local talent in this area. And, you know, it doesn't go unnoticed for me. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. We just got to put it to good use. You know, as soon as live music can happen, give it every fucking thing we got. Well, and I think when you see everybody come back fully, you're going to see a groundswell because all the people that want live music are going to be out there. And as you said earlier, all the bands that are going to be on stage, they're going to be reminded why they want to be there in the first place. It's kind of getting back to none of us got into this to make a lot of money. Yeah, we all had that dream as a kid, but the reality of it is, is you do it for the love of the game. I mean, exactly it's, it's a coin of phrase. It, it, it's the love of the game, you know? And, and, and everybody that's out there that's working hard, I have nothing but respect. Every single person in this town that's gigging, you guys work hard, and you've worked hard, and you've earned it. Cheers. I think it calls for a shot, guys. Yeah. We're going to have to wrap this up, Jimmy. It, yeah. That flew quick by. It went fast. Yes, it did. All right. Real, real quick, this music, yeah. this is out of Huntington, West Virginia. I got sent this. This is a Who's band this? called Liquid 16. Uh, I checked them out on iTunes, and I, they have an album out called Hard Charger. I did not find a bad song. If you guys want to check it out, Liquid 16 on uh, Apple Music. It's great. Sounds good. Excellent. Thanks a lot for having me on, guys. Sure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on, guys. John Gauthier, thanks for being on the social. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. 28 Speedway will be here at Lash Balls on April 10th. April 10th. For an acoustic show. Right here. Acoustic show. And then hopefully when summer opens up, we'll all see you here all real soon. There's going to be an extravaganza. If I have to do it myself, there's going to be one, but I'm not going to be alone. Jimmy's going to be the town's hype man. I'm going to try. <laughs> all right, guys. my show. Thanks Everyone for watching, will be guys. There. Thanks for watching the social. Cheers. Woo.